Okay, so there's three ways to do that. One is calorimetry. You're going to do an experiment with that, not this week, but next week. So you're going to do an experiment and practice that. So calorimetry would be one way. Then we're going to use Hess's law. That's another way. And then the third way is heats of formation. So we're going to go through those three ways to find that number. Okay, so the first one we're going to start with is calorimetry. Okay, because we have a lab coming up on that. And what is calorimetry? That's experimentally we're going to determine the enthalpy of a reaction. So we're going to use what we call a calorimeter. Okay, this one we happen to call it coffee cup calorimeter. <laughs> coffee cup because it's like two styrofoam coffee cups together. I know it's really high tech, but it works really well. So what is the purpose of a calorimeter? Why do we even need that? Well, doesn't the system, the two reacting together, the system in here generates heat, right? And it goes to the surroundings. Well, we've got to measure that heat, so we'll, we'll need to capture it somehow. Otherwise, it just dissipates everywhere, and we can't figure out how much it was. So that's the purpose of the calorimeter, is to contain the heat inside the calorimeter. It's pretty effective. Um, it's a very, very slow transfer of heat. It pretty much holds it all in here. So if you wanted to keep your Starbucks hot longer, then put it, another styrofoam cup in there, and it'll actually retain the heat a lot longer because it's, it keeps the heat in. All right, so we'll put a lid on there. So we have to define our system. Our system is these two reacting together. Well, what's the surroundings? Well, the surroundings would be the solution, the water here, right, because you got the two reacting inside. So this would be the, sur the surroundings as well as the calorimeter itself. You know, that thermometer coming in there, that's going to be part of the surroundings. So this is going to be part of the surroundings, okay? So it would be the solution and the calorimeter. And that's pretty much where it stops. So that's the purpose of a calorimeter. Now, before we can talk about how we're going to calculate that based on this experiment, we have to talk about something called heat capacity. Heat capacity is a physical property. Okay, what is heat capacity? It's a physical property. It's the amount of heat it takes to change something one degree. Okay, that's the amount of heat it takes. Some objects can absorb a lot of heat before they'll change one degree. Others can't absorb very much heat before they change. So we can think of that as like the boulder and a pebble. Okay, so let's think about this. Boulder and a pebble. Some objects with a big heat capacity, some objects with a really large heat capacity is like the big boulder, right? Big heat capacity is like a big boulder. Small heat capacity is like a little pebble. Now, if I were to give both of these a shove, that means I'm applying the same amount of energy to both of these, which one goes farther? The pebble, wouldn't it? Yes. So what's that saying? That's saying that if I have something with a large heat capacity and I have something with a small heat capacity and I give them the same amount of heat, the small one goes to a higher temperature before the other one does, okay? Another way to look at it is what if I want to change both of these by one foot? If I want to move both of them one foot, okay? So if I want to move both of them one foot, which one's going to take the greater amount of energy? Yeah, it's a big boulder, right? It doesn't take much to move that pebble one foot. Okay, so that's what we're saying with heat capacity. If I have an ob substance with a high heat capacity, that means it's going to absorb a lot of energy before it can change one degree. And if I have something with a small heat capacity, it doesn't take much, it, uh, much, a little bit of energy, and already it's at one degree. Is it like boiling two different types of potatoes? Or is the smaller one cook faster? Ah, the bigger one. Well, that's very close. That's very close. What we're talking about now is size. Okay. So the more you have, enthalpy is extensive, right? Yeah. So you got to heat it up more. Okay. So that's very much along those lines. In a big thing, yes, yes, uh huh. Because you have more of it, right? Right now, the temperature will be the same, but because you have more enthalpy, is extensive. Exactly. So yes, it's very much heat capacity. Okay, so now heat capacity comes in different units. We do have to know the units of heat capacity. Okay, if we just say heat capacity, heat capacity, that would be joules, because we're going to measure it in joules. It will be, let's say, heat capacity 
Heat capacity will be in joules per Kelvin or joules per Celsius. Now that's the same number. Do you remember why those two would be the same number? Because, well, if it's per one degree, we don't have to add anything at all because one degree Celsius is exactly the same as one degree Kelvin. It's only the temperature that's different that we add 273, but we're not talking about temperature. We're just talking about per one degree, right? So aren't those the same? But one degree Kelvin is the same as one degree Celsius? It is the same. So these two numbers are exactly the same. And this is interchangeable with those units. So I can make this be a C, and I can make that be a K, and it's totally fine. Yeah, it's the same. Okay, so that's heat capacity is joules per degree. We're going to say it that way, joules per degree. That's heat capacity. So the next one would be molar heat capacity. All right, so what does that word sound like? like Moles. Moles. <laughs> yeah. So instead of joules per degree, we're going to say joules per mole degree. Okay, joules per mole degree. And then the last one would be specific. Specific heat. And that's going to be specifically a certain amount of mass. How much mass? One gram. Okay, so this is referring to a specific amount, specific amount of mass. Think of it that way. And that specific amount of mass is one gram. So it's joules per gram degrees temperature, which would be Celsius or joules per gram Kelvin. All right, does that make sense? Okay, is there a learning objective that says that we're supposed to know the units of those? Yes, isn't there? <laughs> so are we going to learn what those units are? No. Yeah. So if I ask you, hey, what are the units of specific heat, what would you say? Joules per gram degree. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I say specific heat, you're going to tell me joules per gram per degree, right? What if I say heat capacity? What's it going to be? Now, if it's heat capacity, it would just be joules per. Yeah, exactly. And if it's molar heat capacity, that's the one that has joules per mole degree. Okay, so you notice they all have joules. They all have joules, and they all have degrees. Okay, molar is you stick a mole in there, and specific heat is you put grams in there. Okay, you do need to know what those units are. Okay, so let's see if we can. Always the degrees is on the. The bottom. Yes, always on the bottom. Joules always on the top. Degrees always on the bottom. Okay, now here's some different substances with specific heats, and we have joules per gram. That's what we're using. You could have it in calories. We've talked about joules and calories. We can convert between there, but look at what has a really really high specific heat. Water. So think about our big boulder. So that means water can take in a lot of heat before it changes one degree, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, which is a really good thing. Oh, yeah, because it takes, a, yes, because it can absorb a lot of heat before it's going to even go one degree, which is a good thing for your body, right? Because don't we have a lot of water in our system? Yes, so that means we can maintain body temperature. We take a lot of heat in, a lot of heat out, and we can still help maintain that body temperature. So that's a really good thing. Um, let's see, let's look, what about if I compared iron to um, aluminum? Let's look at iron and aluminum. Did everybody see that? Now if I give the same amount of heat to iron as the same amount of heat to aluminum, which one's going to go to a higher temperature first? Mm, it's going to be, think about your big boulder and your small little pebble. Which one, if I give them both the shove, which one's going to go? Yeah, which one's going to go to the higher temperature? Iron. Iron. Does everybody see that? This is like your little pebble. Yeah, it's like a small, small specific heat. Okay? That's like saying I'm going to give the boulder a push and the pebble a push, and you know which one's going to go up to the higher temperature. Right? So if I have aluminum and iron and I'm giving them the same amount of energy, heat, which one goes to the higher temperature? 
iron. Does everybody see that? Yeah, okay. So if you ever look at sand, so doesn't this going to, and compare that to wood, isn't this going to go to a higher, have you ever been on the beach and you're like, ow, it's hot, it's like, ah, so you get over onto the wood and you're like, oh, that's a little better, but it's still hot, so you want to get over into the water, right? <laughs> okay, so those, let's see if we can do a calculation now with our specific heats. A hot water bottle contains 750 grams of water. If the water cools to body temperature, how much heat could be transferred to sore muscles? And we're going to use specific heat. Okay, well, how are we going to calculate that? If you know the units of these three, which we do, then you're going to be able to come up with the equation. So let's see what the equation would be for each one of these. I want our enthalpy. So I want joules. So we want enthalpy. How much enthalpy? Okay, in this case, it's Q, so we'll say Q is equal to heat capacity, which is joules per degree. Now, what would I need to multiply it by to cancel out and just give me only joules? I'd have to multiply it by temperature, wouldn't I? So I'm going to say temperature change, temperature change of my system. All right, so you guys remember what this triangle change is, right? Change in temperature is defined as T perfect. T final minus T initial. Be careful you are picking T final. That's the final temperature. That's not the biggest temperature. That's just the final temperature. So sometimes it could okay. be negative. That's right. So be careful about that. It's the final temperature where you end up, not the biggest one. So T final minus T initial. That's delta T, and then there's our, so these, joule, our heat capacity, so these would cancel, and we're left with Q or in joules. So the units come out to be in joules. All right, so now let's look at molar heat capacity. So how would I get just joules with molar heat capacity? Okay, so I have to multiply it by moles, and again by change in temperature. Well, what if you're given specific heat? Okay, so let's put specific heat up here. Joules per gram degree. What do I multiply it by? Gr mass in grams. That's right. Times change in temperature. Okay, so you'll know these by knowing the units. You'll know what of these you need to use to multiply by to get you your Q. So now let's look at our problem. Specific heat is 4.184 joules per gram degree C. Mm -hmm. So aren't we using this one? Specific heat, specific heat, right? Look at those units. Look at those units for specific heat. So I need to multiply it by the mass in grams. So let's put that in here. So this is 4.184 joules per gram degree C. Okay, so that's the, and I need the mass and I need the change in temperature. All right, see so if you can finish solving that one. Okay, you have to look for the mass in grams, and you need the change in temperature. And how did we define change in temperature? Uh, D final minus, final minus initial. So look carefully at where you're starting and what your final temperature is. Don't just pick the biggest one. Sometimes there'll be a negative number. Sometimes there'll be a positive number. That's going to be important. Okay, see if you can finish that one. And the grams are, are the grams that are given, right? The mm -hmm.
What are you guys doing for Delta T? Uh, it's final minus initial. Very good. So that would be. Mm -hmm. Does everybody see why we say 37? That's T final. It cools down. That's where we end up. So be careful. Don't just pick the big number. It's T final. T final is 37. Does everybody see that? That's where we ended up. So 37 minus 65, that's going to be a negative number. That's totally fine. Be negative 28, yes. Okay, so in here I would put negative 28. Everybody do that? Okay, so our final answer comes out to be a really, really big number, which is fine because joules are very, very small. So what does it come out to be, like a negative... 87864 joules. Okay, this is a negative because we still are retaining that negative. That tells you something. Is this exothermic or endothermic? Exothermic. Wouldn't that make sense? Because isn't the water the system and it's leaving heat? Yeah, trans the system, right. Perfect, perfect. So that's why it's a negative. And if you round, we go with two sig figs because we had two sig figs in our least number so it would be something like 88,000 joules that's a very big number but remember these are small units so you are going to get big numbers like that if you wanted to you could change that to kilojoules so if you wanted to do it that way okay and it'll be given to us like in this but you mean the formula yes that's right. what you're going to have to figure out okay you'll have to know you'll have to know what those formulas are Okay, so now we can do that, right? Everybody can use these equations? Yeah. So let's go back to our coffee cup calorimetry again, and let's talk about how can we solve this problem. How would we do that? Well, to solve this problem, we're going to start with, let's start talking about this is an exothermic process. The system is going to be losing or giving off heat to the surroundings. So enthalpy, this is open to the atmosphere, right? It's under constant uh, pressure, isn't it? So doesn't enthalpy equal Q at constant pressure? Okay, so enthalpy equals Q at constant pressure. So we can say that enthalpy equals Q because we are at constant pressure. So enthalpy equals Q at constant pressure. So let's write constant pressure here. Now, Q, we want enthalpy of the system or reaction. So enthalpy of the reaction. So that's the system that we're talking about, is this enthalpy of the reaction. So Q, we want Q of the system. But I'm standing in the surroundings. The thermometer is part of the surroundings. So let's think about this. I want Q of the system. Let's imagine that you're the surroundings and I'm the system. So if I'm giving off heat, I'm having that be negative, right? But you're the surrounding, so how is that coming across to you? It's positive. It's the same number, isn't it? Just different sign. Okay, so let's write that down. So we'll say Q system is equal to opposite of sign of Q surroundings. Well, then we have to decide Hey, what's the surroundings? I know what the system is. It's these two reacting together. So what's the surroundings? The water solution and the thermometer. So we'll just call that whole thing the calorimeter, right? Okay, so that's what that equals. So let's rewrite that to say minus, and this would be Q of the solution plus Q of the calorimeter. Okay, that's what the surrounding is. Now we have to come up with what is Q solution. Well, Q solution, we're going to use specific heat again. So our specific heat, what are the units of specific heat? Specific Joules, over Joules over gram per degree, right? Okay. And so I would need to multiply that by mass times change in temperature. Perfect. Okay, that's what I'm going to use for Q solution. Now for Q calorimeter, I'm just going to use heat capacity. The units of heat capacity were joules per 
Kelvin, very good. So I would multiply that by change in temperature. So those are my two equations for Q solution and Q calorimetry. So let's rewrite that. Okay, so Q system equals opposite of joules per gram Kelvin times my mass times my delta T plus joules per Kelvin times delta T. And that is your equation that you're going to be using to determine the enthalpy of that reaction. This one right here. Okay, this is the one. Okay, that's not going to be given to you. <laughs> so, so we need to know that one, okay? Yeah, another flashcard. All right, so this is our equation that we use to solve this problem. Oh. It is the Q of the surroundings. It is. So that's why we can do that. It is Q of the surroundings. So don't forget that negative sign. This is the Q of the surroundings, and it is negative, because you know we just talked about it being the opposite. I do want to caution you about this delta T. If this is in Kelvin, and that's in delta T, let's say, is given to you in Celsius, like 10 degrees minus 0 degrees, do you have to change this to Kelvin? No. no. What do you just do? Change that to a C, because it's the same number. Exactly. Um, if you try to change it to Kelvin, let's see what happens. If I change 10 degrees to Kelvin, what is that? 283 Kelvin minus 273 Kelvin. And what do we get? 10. Oh, it's the same, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so don't try to change any of that to Kelvin. Just make this be a C or a K, whatever you need, because it's the same number. So we'll make those be Cs. Okay, so there we go. That's Now let's see if we can solve our calorimetry problem, and you're going to do this in lab. So let's practice this. It's kind of like the same thing that we're going to be doing with our coffee cup calorimetry. Now there's three steps that we do for these calorimetry problems. Step one, to make it simple, we're just going to use step one. Step one is set up a table. The reason why we want a table is because look at all these um, Look at all these variables we have to do. We have to subtract temperatures. Maybe we have to change something to grams. We have all this information. So what I want you to do is set up a table. So set up a table first and fill in the information. Okay, so we need stuff like specific heat. Okay, so these are the things that I need. I need specific heat, so I have to find that. Specific heat. And what else do we need? We need mass. I need delta T, I need heat capacity. Okay, these are the things we need. So let's go ahead and set up a table first because you have to do some subtracting to get delta T, don't you? And you have to make sure things are in the right unit. So let's set the table up first. All right, now look at the problem. Specific heat. Okay, so um, do we have specific heat of my solution? Does everybody see? And a mass and a specific heat of... There it is. And you recognize that as specific heat, don't you? Because you know the units. So I know there's a lot of information in here, but we're just going to go through and pick out what we need. That's the 4.18 joules per gram. Okay, so this is the 4.18 joules per gram degree. Now, I need the mass. What I'm putting is 50 mils of silver nitrate and 50 mils of 0.1 molar HCl are mixed together in a calorimeter. So I have to add those together, don't I? Because isn't that the total volume, total mass of my system, solution? Total mass of solution. I need the total mass. So in this case, it says, hey, assume the combined solution has a mass of 100 grams. Well, what if you're not given that statement? Then you have, yes, you have to, that's right. You, you do have to convert to grams. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to do moles so much as we need to do density because I'm talking about volume. So that would be, if you wanted to get that, you would say 50 mils plus 50 mils, assuming they add together equally like that, that would be 100 mils. Yeah. Well, that's mostly water. Does anybody know what the density of water is? 
Density of water is pretty much one. One gram per mil. Density of water is one gram per mil. Now that will vary a little bit with temperature. You'll see that when we get into the lab. So it's one gram per mil. So if I have a total volume of 100 mils, do you guys remember how we would find mass? Okay, so let's put our triangle back up here. Density is mass over volume. So if I am looking for mass, density times the volume. And so if the volume is 100 mils times my density is going to be my mass. So in this case, it would be 100 grams. Okay, so you see how we have to do a little bit of conversions over here? That's why I want you to set the table up first. Because we have, might have to do a calculation to find the mass using density. Now we have to do a calculation with delta T. So you know what that is. It's T final minus T initial, right? So what's T final minus T initial? What is that? What's T final? 23.11 minus 22.30. 3-0, so that equals, yes, 0.81. Okay. All right, now I need heat capacity. Do you notice heat capacity is not mentioned in this problem? Because sometimes the heat capacity of the calorimeter is so small, it's negligible. Do you know what negligible means? Yeah. It means we... We can ignore it. So if it doesn't mention heat capacity of the calorimeter, we're going to say it's zero. Now, when you do this in lab, you're going to get a number, so you're going to have to write that number in. But for this problem, it's zero. Now, enthalpy is extensive. It means it matters how much you have. So when you're doing your experiment like this, you have to be very careful on your volumes. Measure your volumes carefully, because if you have more volume, guess what? you're going to have bigger enthalpy. Somebody having less volume will have slower enthalpy, smaller amount of enthalpy. So watch that carefully because we know enthalpy is extensive. So here is my table. I finally finished my table. I got all the information. I did my delta T. I got the density. I have all my things that I need. So step two in this process would be to solve it. Okay, so step two is this part where you just put it into your equation. Okay, so this is step two would be to solve it using our equation. So we can do that. That would be a minus my 4.18, I know that one, times the mass, well we said that was 100 grams, times my delta T, that's 0.81, plus, remember to add these two together first before you take that negative sign. That negative sign is on the outside of that bracket. Plus, then I'm going to do the same thing over here, except this time I'm going to say 0 times 0.81. Okay, so you add these together first, then you take the negative. Don't take the negative of just 1. It's outside the whole bracket. So there you go, and our answer comes out to be what? Exactly. A negative, right? Watch that sign. Negative 338.58 joules. That's my answer for Q. Great, and then here comes the third step. Step three would be units. It's like a whole other problem. <laughs> so this means we have to get it into the right units. What is this asking for? It says calculate the enthalpy for this reaction in what units? Kilojoules, what, per? Per mole. Per mole of what? Of, of silver nitrate. Okay, you have to get it into these units. Kilojoules per mole of silver nitrate. Not just the joules that we found. That's a good, that's good, you got that, but that's not what the units are. Okay, enthalpy matters how much you have, right? So if you've got more enthalpy and you've got less enthalpy, that number is going to be different for everyone. But if we would all divide by the moles of what we used, then our numbers should be comparable. Okay, so that's why we got to work to put it in the right unit so we can actually compare them. So this is kilojoules. You know joules are so small, so we're going to do kilojoules. And then you have to divide it by the moles of silver nitrate. So that means I'm going to need the moles of silver nitrate. Okay, so my units are going to have to be kilojoules 
divided by moles of silver nitrate. That's the units that I want. So now, how do we do that? Well, okay, so everybody see how we can convert this to kilojoules? All right, so let's go ahead and convert that to kilojoules. That's a negative 0.33858 kilojoules. Okay, so we write that down. I got that. That's a negative 0.33858 kilojoules divided by, oh, now how am I going to find moles of silver nitrate? If you look in that problem, there is no moles of silver nitrate. You have the volume. Mm, we have volume. Mmm, hundred of the solution, but I'm not wanting the moles yeah. of solution, just the silver nitrate. So, so it's 50. Oh, but do we have, we got volume and we have, what else do you know about silver nitrate? You have that molarity. Does everybody see that? 50 mils of 0.1 molar silver nitrate. So you have to convert to liters and multiply Okay, so how am I going to get moles? I have to convert the mils to liters and then say... What? Molarity times volume. Okay, so remember that little triangle? Let's put that back up here. Molarity is defined as moles per liter. So if I want moles, what do I have to do? Multiply molarity times liters. Well, I have molarity, so I have the 0 0.100 molar of silver nitrate. But I need to have liters. So can everybody convert 50 mils to liters? Yeah, 0 0.050 liters. Zero liters. Okay, so this will give me the, by doing this, then I would get the moles of my silver nitrate. So I multiply that together and I get what? 0 0.0050 moles of silver nitrate, right? Okay, now I can put that in here. 0 0.0050 moles of silver nitrate. And then our final answer comes out to be... It's getting a little squishy here. Yep, negative 67.716 kilojoules which we round to two sig figs if we wanted to do that. What are we rounding to, what, three sig figs? So we're rounding it to three sig figs, so it would be, what, 67.7 kilojoules per mole of silver nitrate. Oh, squishy over here. Okay, so our answer is 67.7 kilojoules per mole of silver nitrate. That's your final answer. That is the final answer. Not this one. Do you see that? If you put this answer down as your final answer, would you be correct? No. no, you would not be correct. So just this number alone would not be correct. You have to get it into the correct units, which would be kilojoules per mole of silver nitrate. So you're going to have to find, the, you're going to have to convert that to kilojoules. That should be easy. And then you're going to have to find the moles of silver nitrate. And you know how to do that because we know how to do that with molarity, don't we? Okay, so you use molarity times the liters to give you the moles of silver nitrate. And then you divide those out to give you the right units. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so can we do that? Okay, so you're going to have three steps, right? The first step was what? What do we have to do for the first one? Set up a table. What's the second one? Solve it. And what's the third one? Units. units. You know how important units are, right? Okay. So that's how we do coffee cup calorimetry. And that's what we're going to be doing in lab is coffee cup calorimetry. Now, there's another type of calorimetry that we're going to do. And that's called bomb calorimetry. Okay. Yes. Oh, because it needs to be negative. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's do another type of calorimetry. This is called bomb calorimetry. So let's see what the difference is between coffee cup and bomb. Now, do you remember coffee cup was open to the atmosphere? So is it constant pressure? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, bomb calorimetry is sealed. 
So is it open to the atmosphere anymore? Yeah. No. So what is bomb calorimetry? Well, we're going to take, this is your whole ca bomb calorimeter. This is a sealed inside piece, and it's the bomb. <laughs> so here's your solid. There's no solution this time. It's just the solid. Now the solid, what are we going to do? We're going to combust it. So we got oxygen coming in. We have oxygen in here. We got these little ignition wires. So we're going to burn our substance. We're going to combust it. Got little ignition wires. Got the oxygen in here. And it's going to get hot, obviously. And heat is going to go from here into the water, surrounding water. Okay, now this is sealed, so it's not at constant pressure anymore. Pressure is going to go up in there. So we have heat coming out into our water, and then we have our thermometer. But we also have this little blade, this little fan blade, and it whirls the solution around so all the water is at a steady temperature so we can get a good temperature reading. So this whole thing is called the bomb calorimeter. So we're going to do the same one, two, three steps with the coffee cup as we did the bomb calorimeter. The only thing that changes is our equation on solving it. So let's talk about how that equation is going to be with the bomb calorimeter. Now, this is not under constant pressure, so enthalpy does not really equal heat. We can do some derivations to calculate it so that it will equal heat, but for the purposes of what we're doing, we're just going to assume it's close enough. So we're going to say enthalpy of the reaction is close enough to the Q of the system. It's not exactly like it was with constant pressure, but and you can calculate it exactly, but we're not going to do those additional calculations. We're just going to say it's close enough. Okay, so enthalpy is equal to Q of the system. Now, just like what we did before, where we had enthalpy of the system, Q of the system. In this case is when pressure is constant, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, this is not under. No, no. Which one was under constant pressure? That's the, the coffee cup. The coffee cup. Is this one under constant pressure? No. no. This is under constant volume. The volume. Okay, because that's a sealed amount. Okay. All right, so. Bomb calor under is under constant what? Volume. That's right. This one's under constant volume. Okay, so let's set up this equation. So Q system is the same thing that we said before, opposite of Q surroundings. Okay, well, the system is this sample right here. That's the system, and everything else is going to be the surroundings. So do I have a solution in this case? Do, is there a solution here? No, so I don't have Q solution. Well, what's the only thing I've got is just the bomb calorimeter, which is the surroundings, right? There's no solution here. There's my system right there. Everything else is the bomb calorimeter. Mm -hmm. So that's all I've got. So Q system then is equal to opposite of the heat capacity times the delta temperature because that's Q of the calorimeter. Okay? Here, so let's, let's rewrite that again. Let's say Q of the system is equal to opposite Q of the calorimeter because that's the only thing I have is my surroundings. Therefore, Q of the system, and we remember our formula for Q calor calorimeter is heat capacity, which is, what's the units of heat capacity? Yeah, heat capacity. Joules per joules per. Oh, joules per mole. No, that's molar heat capacity. Okay, there we go. Joules per degree Celsius or degree Kelvin. Now you guys are going to remember those units, right? Yes. Yes, you've got to know those units. All right, times delta T. So this is your equation. So it's a little bit shorter equation, isn't it? Yes. A little bit simpler, right? Yes. yes. But it's the same three steps. So now let's go back over here to our table section, except now it simplifies our table quite a bit, doesn't it? Because what do we need in our table? Yeah, that's all we need. What is the heat capacity? And delta T, which is T final minus T initial. That's all I need. 
And then step two, you multiply those together. And then step three, we got to get it in the right units. Well, there's no solution, so now I take off that molarity. I still have to put it in the correct units, but I don't have a solution anymore. Instead, I have a solid. So if I'm going to get moles of a solid, you know how to do that, right? Yes, you know how to do that. That's molar mass, isn't it? Okay, so let's take a look at this problem. The, bomb, the heat capacity of a bomb calorimeter is this. 10 grams of an unknown compound, okay, now you have molar mass, is completely burned in this calorimeter. The temperature of the water inside rose by 4 degrees. Okay, so they already gave us the delta T. It was, says it's 4 degrees. <coughs> Did they give us heat capacity? Yes. Okay, what is that? 30 joules over Celsius. Okay, 30 joules over Celsius. <coughs> All right, that's step one. That's done. You only needed the heat capacity and the delta T. We got that. Okay, see if you can do steps two and three. Okay, so our ending units are kilojoules per mole of unknown. So kilojoules per mole of unknown. So we're working on step two, which is solving it. You know, watch your signs. Don't drop. Don't be dropping off this negative sign. Okay, is everybody remembering that? Okay, don't drop off that negative sign. Okay, now did you solve step two? Does everybody get step two? Okay, now you got to get it into the right units. That's the third step. Okay, so we have to get it into the right units. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's totally fine. Oh, bless you. Kilojoules. Kilojoules. Per mole. It says calculate. 
Yeah, uh, heat of combustion. We're going to do that in kilojoules. Okay, so kilojoules per mole. What does your answer come out to be? I didn't do the math because I thought this was like the molar heat capacity. Like it wanted, I thought it wanted it in molar heat capacity. No, it, there is no molar heat capacity. It's per mole of the unknown. Per mole of the unknown. Moles of the unknown. There is no molar heat capacity. Oh, right? well, I thought when it said calculate heat of combustion per mole, I thought it, it was asking for that smaller heat capacity. That's oh, what yeah, no, no. So this is, what did you guys get for your answer? Negative 120. What's the units here? Joules. Okay, so now you got to get it over to the right units. And we're going to do kilojoules per mole of the unknown. No, how many moles of the unknown do you have? That's what you need to figure Oh, kilojoules, yeah. You divide that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's do that. Negative, what, 0 0.120 kilojoules. Okay, so we got that. You got the negative 0 0.120 kilojoules. Now you need the moles of the unknown. We got to like give it some like 12 pounds or something like that. No, they give us the mass and the mole mass. One, one go to 60 and then go to mm -hmm. point one. Point 0.16. What'd you guys get for the moles? Point, point, one, six, seven. point 0.167, right? Because it was 10 grams and the molar mass. So you know how to divide those out to get the moles, right? Yes. Okay, so we would divide that out and we get point what? One, six, seven. Moles of the unknown? Yes. Is it okay if I just use one six on the bottom? That's what it came out to. Um, I, would, I would do more. Sig yeah, more sig figs. Otherwise, you're going to have to round your answer to only two sig figs. Yeah. So I would do more sig figs on that one. Okay, so what is your final? What's your final? Okay, so negative. What'd you get? So let's go to three sig figs. Oh, okay. Well, so, 7197. Nine. 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 This one, molar mass, 10 grams. And you know how 60, you have to say 10 grams divided by. Okay. Wait, it's point seven one nine, yeah. And then that would be kilojoules per mole of the unknown. Okay, so we see how we did that? One, two, three steps. Now, if you compare the two, this one's a little bit easier because this one doesn't have as many parts to its convert to its equation. So your table over here is a little simpler, but it's still the same process. And then you put it in to solve it, and then you got to get it into the right units. Again, this is a little different. Last time with a solution, we had to use molarity, didn't we? Yes. Okay, this time we don't have a solution, right? So we would use moles, and you know how to do moles with the solid, right? That's molar mass. Okay, and that molar mass comes from the periodic table, right? It's grams in one mole, so you would use that to find the moles, then divide it out to get it in the right units. Okay, so questions about how we do calorimetry. So that was coffee cup calorimetry and bomb calorimetry. You have two different equations. Make sure you do know those two equations to be able to solve it, but it's the same three steps as we go, one, two, and three. Okay, does that make sense? Steps one, two, and three, both coffee cup and bomb calorimetry. Now, coffee cup occurs under constant what? Pressure. 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 And bomb calorimetry is under constant volume. volume. Okay, well, that's the one method. So let's talk about the next one. That's Hess's Law, which I think is kind of fun. I like Hess's Law. So the first method that we talked about was coffee cup and bomb calorimetry. Now we're going to talk about Hess's law. So what we're looking for is the enthalpy of a reaction. 
And then the third way we're going to do it is heats of formation. So we're looking for the enthalpy of a reaction. And if you think about it, think back to our trues and what we know about enthalpy. And enthalpy is a state function, right? Did we remember we talked about state function? But what's a state function? It's independent of the pathway, right? So it doesn't matter how you get there. You have a start and you have an end. All that matters is the difference between the start and the end. It doesn't matter how we get there. Enthalpy is a state function. Okay, so we're going to use that in Hess's law. Enthalpy is a state function. It's independent of how we get there as long as we start here and end there. So in our bond calorimeter, which is great, we can do lots of substances, but not everything will give us what we want. We can't use everything through coffee cup or bomb calorimetry. Okay, so let's say, for example, I want this reaction A from here to there. This is reactants, that's products. I need to be from here to there. Well, I can do that with one reaction, or since enthalpy is a state function, can't I do that through two different reactions? Yes, as long as I start here and end there, I could do it either way. I could go straight with one reaction, or I could add two enthalpies together. So that's what we're doing, is we're taking two enthalpies together, and we're adding them together to give us what we would have gotten if we'd have just gone straight there. Because all that matters is from where we start and where we end up. It's independent of the pathway. So it doesn't matter whether we go through A or B through C. So this is what Hess's law is saying. Hess's law is saying that the enthalpy of a reaction, the enthalpy of the reaction is equal to the sum of all the pieces, the sum of the different reactions, like we said in our previous picture here, it's the sum of B plus C. So if B plus C is the same thing, then I can just add them together. So enthalpy is the overall enthalpy of a reaction is equal to the sum of the enthalpy changes for the individual steps. And we're going to call those individual steps. Those B and C are going to be individual steps. So if this is my equation, those are my reactants, that's my product, that's what I want to get. I can have an individual steps, two individual steps that will take me from these reactants to that product. And these are the two individual steps that can do that. So all I have to do is make sure that these add together to give me my in reactants and products. And if they match the reactants and the products, then all I got to do is add those together. And that's Hess's law. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think this part's going to be kind of fun. If you like doing puzzles, it's kind of like puzzles. Yay, I do. <laughs> okay, so we will work on how we're actually going to make sure that these two will add together to give us our what we want with our reactants and our products. So we'll do that on Wednesday. Okay, so we'll practice that on Wednesday. All right, whew, good job, everyone. Good job.